This lecture is uh, from chapter number two of the textbook of mechanics of materials by Bear and Johnson. The topic is stress and strain under axial loading. Before this chapter, uh, we have already gone through chapter number one, which was introduction to this to this uh, course. And in the introduction chapter, we have already discussed about the concept of stress, normal stresses. And definition of normal stress, the, the types and uh, the shear stresses. So now we will discuss about axial loading and the stresses and strains produced under axial loading. We have already uh, discussed what is axial loading in chapter 1. Axial load is a, a centric load which passes through the centroid of a member, of a axial member. Axial member is a kind of member which we usually uh, define as a prismatic member. It can be a cylinder, it can be a square bar, it can be a rectangular bar and uh, there is a centric axis. Uh, axis passes uh, passing through the centroid and if the load is applied uh, along the centric axis it is called axial load. This load passes through the centroid of the member. The member can be round, uh, cylindrical, or it can be square. It can be any other shape. Okay. Before that, uh, the first basic topic is normal strain. In the first chapter, we have already discussed about stresses. Now we will discuss about strains and deformations as well. Normal strain uh, is caused due to normal load. If a bar is subjected to a direct load due to stress in the bar, there will be a change in the length. If the bar has an original length of L and it changes by an amount delta, the strain will be delta over L. For example, if I have a bar and it is fixed from an end, for example, there is a load P. If the initial length of the bar is L and after the load it is extended by an amount of delta. This is a positive change. This is an increase in length. It can be a decrease in length as well. So this change in length, delta divided by original length, it is uh, normal strain. Delta is deformation, remember it. It is change in length. And strain is ratio of change in length divided by the initial length. So strain has no unit, while deformation will be uh, will have a unit of length. It can be meter, inch, millimeter, uh, foot, or whatever. So if, the if this load P is compressive instead of tensile, so there can be a negative delta, and the strain will be negative. So if the strain is tensile, it will be positive. If it is compressive, it will be negative. Due to tensile strain, we have a increase in length. And due to compressive strength, we usually get decrease in length. Okay. Now, how the normal strain behaves and uh, what parameters does it depend on? For example, we have a bar of length L, and if a load P is applied, the cross sectional area is A. Remember that this area is perpendicular area. If we see it in the third dimension, the bottom view of this bar, so this is perpendicular to the load. That is why it is called normal. So, load is normal to the area. So, in such case, strain is equal to delta over uh, length and stress is equal to force divided by area, P over A. Now, what happens if we double the load or if we double the area or if we double the length? So, if we double the area, and also double the load. So stress will be 2P over 2A. Double load divided by double area. So 2P over A, so it is again P over A. Now we have doubled the load, but the length is same. If the length is same, so the deformation will be same. It will not be doubled. The deformation does not depend upon the load. It, it, it depends upon the material actually. If the length is L, deformation is delta. If we increase length to 2L, 
and stress is again the same in all the three cases stress is P over A if the stress is same so the strain will be same we have doubled the length in this case 2L so deformation will be doubled automatically again the ratio 2 del divided by 2L will be del over L so strain will be same so if the stress is same strain will be same it does not depend the strain does not depend upon load it depends upon um, stress actually actually the stress depends upon strain so the strain is same stress is same okay so it means if we are doubling the length if the material is same and the applied stress is same so the strain will be same if we are doubling the length so the deformation will be doubled by itself so it means strain is actually a material property if the material is same strain will be same and we will discuss it how the strain is a material property and how does it depend upon the material we will discuss it in Hooke's law later on here it is what is Hooke's law it was uh, introduced by Hooke's uh, and the law is all deformable materials deform under loads definitely before this in engineering statics we have discussed about uh, def uh, undef uh, non-deformable materials uh, rigid materials and uh, rigid materials or rigid bodies are those bodies which cannot be deformed under load but in this subject we are discussing about deformable materials so we will discuss uh, about deformation now so deformable materials can be deformed under loads in the absence of load there will be no deformation so under load there will be deformation a material is said to be elastic if it returns to its original position after the removal of the load if there is a material and we are applying a load P on it and it, it extends by some amount delta if I remove the load it will return to its original position this delta will be this delta will disappear this is uh, this this property of the material is called elasticity and the material is called to be an elastic limit or elastic region so if we remove the load and the material returns to its original position this is called elasticity and in this elastic region or in this elastic material stress is proportional to strain this is Hooke's law stress is proportional to strain previously we have studied in engineering physics a force or load is proportional to deformation our load is equal to k delta now we are saying stress is proportional to strain and stress is equal to e epsilon e is modulus of elasticity and it is the proportionality constant here e is a material property modulus of elasticity okay it is here this is a material property different materials have different moduli of elasticities and uh, the strain depends upon this E okay so E is a ratio of stress and strain if the material is changed the value of E will be changed this, elast this expression of Hooke's law is only applicable within the elastic region what is elastic region we will discuss it in the next slide uh, in, the in the topic of stress strain curve Ela some materials are totally elastic there is no permanent deformation in those materials the materials are called elastic materials some materials undergo elastic and plastic deformations uh, in under different loads under some loads under lower loads uh, under uh, the loads of low magnitude the materials do not deform permanently they remain in the elastic region whenever we remove the load the material will return to its original position so that region is called elastic region and after some certain amount of load the material will be permanently deformed and that is the elastic limit be beyond that limit material will be permanently deformed so below that load the material is said to be in elastic region some materials are totally elastic some have elastic and plastic regions separately okay now we will discuss uh, the elastic and plastic regions separately okay 
So our next topic is stress strain test. This is a very important test, a very basic test for uh, in the, for the subject of mechanics of materials. By this test, we can evaluate tensile properties of uh, a material or compressive properties of a material. As a result of a stress strain test, we draw a diagram between stress and strain. In this test, we usually cut a specific specimen, testing specimen from a material. The test is uh, performed under some standards against some standards, uh, usually American Society for Testing Materials, ASTM standards or some other society standards, established society standards. Okay, uh, we just hold this specimen in a universal testing machine. Here is the specimen. It is held by the machine jaws from the two ends and tensile force is applied on it or compressive force is applied. Either the jaws move away from each other or they may move towards each other. In case of moving towards each other, the, sem the sample or the specimen remains under compression. If the jaws are moving away from each other, the specimen or the material will be under tension. Okay, so this material is under, if this material is under tension, there will be tensile loads at the ends. This threaded end uh, is held in the machine. The threads are to produce friction between the machine jaw and the specimen to held, to, to held it tightly so that there is no slippage. We usually specify two points on the specimen. Between the two points we have length, initial length L and after applying force on it, these two points will move away from each other and this length will increase. There will be a change in length that will be called delta and we can find uh, the, the, the strain from delta divided by L. The, the, the value of delta is given to us by the machine and the applied load is also given to us by the machine. From the applied load we can find stress. How we can find stress? Simply the cross-sectional area of this portion where we are considering the length. So the area will be constant between these two points. This is cross-sectional area in third dimension. So we can simply divide load, applied load divided by area to find stress and change in length divided by original length to find strain. As soon as we increase the load, the stress will increase and similarly delta will increase. So strain will increase. So we record different values of load and deformation. Uh, and similarly, we can calculate different values of stresses and strains from the loads and deformations. Then we draw them against each other. Here I will draw a diagram. Between stress and strain. On the horizontal axis, we have uh, strain. And on the vertical axis, we have stress. Okay. Initially, when there is no load, there is no deformation. Or if there is no deformation, there is no. It means there is no reaction force in the material. What what the stress is calculated from? It is load divided by area, but that load is actually the reaction force. Uh, P is actually the reaction force uh, against the external load. Okay. So at zero load, there is zero deformation. As soon as we increase the load or if the machine applies load, so the material will deform. Due to the deformation, strain will increase using this expression. Due to the deformation, strain, if deformation is increasing, strain will increase. Okay. With the strain increasing, we will have stress increasing. Internal reaction force is P divided by A. The internal reaction forces will increase, so stress will increase. So as the strain increases, stress will increase, internal resistance of the material will increase. Initially it will be linear relationship. Up till some certain point, which is called proportional limit. Until proportional limit P point, 
the stress will be linearly proportional to strain okay after this point shortly after this point very near to it there will be elastic limit e after point p after proportional limit if we keep on increasing the deformation keep on applying the load so again more deformation will be produced there will be more stress so there comes point e until e the material is elastic if we remove the load this material will return uh, to its original point its point o initial point origin so the difference between p and e proportional limit and elastic limit is up till proportional limit stress is linearly proportional to strain after point p between p and e the stress is not linearly proportional to strain but again the material is still elastic it will return to its original position okay but these two points are very near to each other and they are considered to be same uh, generally we cannot differentiate between p and e for all the, uh, for for generally for all materials it is very rare that we uh, the, the 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 difference can be recognized between p and e generally for all materials p and e is almost the same they are considered same okay suddenly after e there is yield point yield point is the point from where permanent deformation in the material starts before yield there will be elastic deformation only non permanent deformation only but as soon as we reach the yield point permanent deformation will start in the material okay now there are two types of yield points one is upper yield and the other one is lower yield okay what is upper yield and what is lower yield when we apply force on materials at on the atomic level there is an atomic structure the atoms are connected to each other through some bonds and when we apply forces external forces these bonds are under uh, external load so they they will either stretch or they will be compressed the bond length will tend to increase or decrease so definitely naturally a material resists to it so the it will resist against the change in length of the bond if in this case in this figure we are applying a tensile force the so we are trying to to elongate the bonds the bonds will resist if we remove the external load these bond lengths will be restored to their original origin, the original uh, positions original lengths okay this is internal resistance of the material at atomic level okay if we keep on increasing the force there will be a point when this bond cannot resist permanently and it will be deformed permanently this is initial length so after yielding point it will be permanently deformed it will not return to its original position after the removal of the load so there is a permanent deformation okay before the uh, yield point if we remove the load it will return to its original position okay now there is an equilibrium arrangement of uh, atomic structure when we apply force we are trying to disturb that equilibrium within the elastic uh, region or below the yielding point there is a one kind of uh, equilibrium arrangement once the material reaches yield point where i have written y this is actually upper yield here i will mention it is upper yield upper yield okay once the material reaches upper yield point there is a slip inside the uh, material at the atomic level the atomic planes slip upon each other and it at uh, it shifts itself from one equilibrium state to another equilibrium state 
there is a new equilibrium state of at the atomic level in this uh, in this transition state when the material achieves uh, or when the material shifts from one equilibrium state to another equilibrium state so its resistance falls it cannot resist as much as it could do earlier so if the resistance falls stress will decrease again vertical axis is stress axis so stress will decrease again the resistance will decrease so definitely stress is has decreased although the strain has increased but stress has decreased once the material reaches a new equilibrium position so it will again starts resisting to it will again start uh, resisting to the external loads or resistance to the deformations and again with increase in deformation stress will increase so this point is lower yield point between upper yield and lower yield stress is decreasing although strain is increasing but stress is decreasing although we are applying external force with the force the generally the stress should increase because we say that stress is equal to force divided by area if the external force has, in, has been increased there should be an internal resistance equal internal resistance and the force by uh, the resistance force divided by area should be stress but the internal resistance is weaker because of the change in the equilibrium state at the atomic level so the stress decreases for some time and after lower yield point is achieved it means the, the the at the atomic level the material has achieved a new equilibrium state and then again it starts resisting and with the deformation stress will increase again until some point which is called ultimate stress this is the maximum limit we can achieve or the maximum capacity of our material which can uh, it, it can resist against the external loads and the deformations after this material cannot resist even though the strain is increasing or the deformation is increasing stress will decrease ultimate strength or ultimate limit is the maximum limit or the maximum resistance of the material it can offer so after this even though the stress is in the, the strain is increasing external loads have been increased but the stress will not increase stress will, will fall down so it means the stress is material property in this case okay now what happens here the stress is decreasing although there is a strain in the material until some limit or after uh, some deformation the material will rupture it will be broken down into two pieces we are talking about tensile loads so it will be broken into two pieces fracture occurs under tensile load this is called rupture point or sigma r sigma rupture after sigma u after ultimate limit actually it should go like this by definition by mathematics stress is equal to p over a so once we are increasing load the external loads are being applied by the machine in the uh, universal testing machine so stress should actually increase so by you, by this formula of stress stress should increase so i have shown it with the dotted line this is called true stress strain curve but actually it is decreasing in this region it is not following the formula of stress is equal to p over a it is actually decreasing at the material level so why is it decreasing because the material cannot resist material cannot resist so it will the stress will fall down this curve is called engineering stress strain curve engineering which is the real one this happens actually now why it fractures why it ruptures actually when we apply force on a material on a ductile material specifically what is a ductile material ductile material is a material which can be permanently deformed into a new shape or into a new length under load ok 
can brittle materials cannot be duct, uh, deformed permanently so we will discuss about brittle and ductile materials uh, later on okay now currently we are talking about ductile only once we are applying external forces and we reach the ultimate limit this limit what happens the area at some point starts decreasing the cross section area this is called necking you can see a neck here area has started to decrease if the area is decreasing and external load is uh, is increasing stress should increase actually because stress is proportional to load load is increasing stress should increase stress is inversely proportional to area area is decreasing stress should increase but actually it is not increasing you can see here it is not increasing it is decreasing here so what is going to happen because the material cannot resist that is why stress is decreasing there is no internal resistance area is decreasing there will be some point that the area will reach to a minimum value almost equal to zero if area is decreasing at some instance if area is almost equal to zero it means there is just a point contact between the upper part and the lower part so stress will be almost infinite theoretically it should it should be infinite okay so it's, if it should be infinite the material cannot bear it and it will be it will fracture into two parts after fracture we can see that there are two parts one is cone the other is one is cup so there is a raised part and there is a um, cup part uh, this, this is a concave part and this is convex part you can see such kind of uh, shapes if you practically deform a ductile material under load you can personally observe it or if you do a test in a mechanics of materials laboratory under uh, UTM machine so you can see like this most of the metals are ductile and the metallic specimens are the polymer specimens can be deformed in such a way so this test or this shape of a stress strain diagram is that of a ductile material okay and the cup and cone fracture happens in ductile material okay so previously i have shown here a detailed stress strain diagram where i have shown proportional limit elastic limit yield point or yield limit the elastic proportional and yield points are so near to each other that they are generally considered single point and they are simply labeled as yield point or yield strain or sometimes uh, in some books they are called uh, this point is called actually elastic limit or elastic strength so generally it is yield strength or elastic strength yield limit or elastic li limit beyond this limit uh, sorry below this limit the material behaves elastically it will return to its original position after removal of the load beyond this point the material behaves plastically it will be permanently deformed if the load is above the yield strength so now from now on we will simply uh, talk about yield strength only we will simply mention yield strength we will not discuss about elastic limit plus uh, proportional limit and yield limit separately so all these points will be called uh, yield strength or yield point okay so here in this diagram this is a diagram for low carbon steel we can see here is a yield limit sigma y okay below the before the yield limit this is elastic region in the elastic region the stress strain curve is a straight line it is a linear relationship so hooke's law can be applied here e is slope of this line which is modulus of elasticity which will be equal to stress divided by strain okay between upper yield and lower yield as i have discussed earlier there is a fall of stress stress is decreasing because of the uh, rearrangement of atoms in the material at atomic level 
there is a the 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 atomic structure shifts from one equilibrium point to another equilibrium point one equilibrium state to another equilibrium state so this region is called yielding region okay okay after lower yield point in some materials we cannot even observe this yielding region there is no separate uh, upper yield and lower yield point so in some of the materials we can observe it in some of them we cannot like, like in the aluminum alloy here we can see after yielding point the, the stress will keep on increasing we cannot observe the yielding region at the macro scale okay then after yielding there is strain hardening strain hardening is a phenomena uh, uh, in uh, through uh, is a phenomena which is called the per, uh, which is actually the permanent deformation of a material without applying load uh, it is just like hot working we have discussed in material sciences subject that if a material is deformed permanently by applying heat to it uh, by softening it through through heating then and then permanently changing it, its shape it is called hot working but if we change the shape of a material without applying heat it is called cold working or strain hardening so this region is actually a permanent deformation region without applying heat so that is why this is called strain hardening region and after ultimate limit under fracture as i have discussed earlier that the cross sectional area starts decreasing just like this one this is called necking region this is necking phenomena and after necking the material ruptures are fractures okay these detailed points the proportional limit the elastic limit the upper yield and lower yield the yielding region the necking they are not all visible in, for all materials some of for some of the material we cannot even see the upper and lower yield points and there will be single yield strength point and then there will be ultimate and then rupture for us usually the elastic region is important this is elastic region elastic region and from the slope of the first linear relationship between stress and strain we can find e modulus of elasticity and then we have ultimate strength these are some of the important uh, points in the stress strain diagram yield point is important sigma y ultimate strength is important sigma u and then strain at breakup this is also important okay these two diagrams shown on the screen are for ductile materials ductile materials are those materials which can be drawn into wire shape by applying force ductile materials are those materials which can be deformed permanently usually you can deform some of the most of the metals permanently if you take a metal wire or a metal part a metal sh uh, body of any shape you can deform it permanently by applying force a very simple example is a bubble gum you can chew it and you can deform it by applying force you can make any shape out of it rubber is an ex uh, sorry not uh, most of the polymers are actually uh, ductile materials even rubber is a ductile material but it is a super elastic material you can see elasticity uh, you can observe elasticity at macro scale once you apply force on a rubber or any other polymer you can see uh, you can see deformation in it and after removing the force you can see that it will return to its original position but if you keep on increasing the load there will be a point that after that uh, the the material will not return to its original position and it will keep on deforming permanently such kind of materials are called ductile materials uh, polymers are, are an example of uh, ductile material most of the metals are ductile materials low carbon steel is here in front of you aluminum alloys are mostly ductile materials okay then there is another type of material which is called uh, brittle material like glass is a brittle material if we apply force on glass it will deform if we remove the force it will return to its original position most of the time we cannot observe it at macro scale uh, but on micro scale the glass deforms elastically and after removal of the load it will remove it will return to its original position but if we keep on increasing the load 
it will fracture suddenly you cannot produce permanent deformation in glass at room temperature it will fracture suddenly so the brittle materials cannot be deformed permanently just like polymers and metals you cannot simply deform glass permanently at any force so it will fracture if you cross its elastic limit so brittle materials do not have yielding region or yielding strength they do not undergo through yielding phenomena so they will directly rupture they will directly fracture they directly have ultimate strength even there is no necking in the brittle materials you can see necking is actually permanent deformation you can observe it if you remove the load you can see the neck but in glass or in any other brittle material you cannot see a neck or any kind of permanent deformation so they will rupture suddenly there is no permanent deformation so for brittle materials we have this kind of curve there is an elastic region and there is only an elastic region this whole region is elastic region for brittle materials only okay the slope of this line will be e which is modulus of elasticity and then there will be sigma ultimate which is also sigma rupture there is no sigma yielding there is no sigma y for brittle materials they do not undergo yielding they do not undergo permanent deformation they do not undergo a change of equilibrium state at the atomic level the equilib the change the only change will be a fracture the bond will be broken permanently it cannot be deformed the bond will be fractured actually it will not be deformed permanently okay and there is no cup and cone shape after fracture there will be planar fracture you can see this is a plane similarly at this level there will be a plane there is no cup and cone a raised shape and a cup shape concave or concave convex surfaces there will be planar surfaces okay so brittle materials do not deform permanently ductile materials deform permanently and the stress strain curves are different than each other brittle materials have only elastic region ductile materials have elastic region yielding region and then plastic region or permanent deformation region which is also called strain hardening region and then there is necking so the stress strain curve of ductile materials is usually a detailed one if you can understand stress strain curve of a ductile material so this this subject will be very, very easy for you usually the study of materials will be very easy for you because behavior of ductile materials is very detailed one there are so many minor points so many details in this diagram and this is totally a conceptual diagram by understanding this diagram you can understand the behavior of a material what is going on inside a material under load a similar kind of behavior can be seen under compressive load as well a similar shape of diagram will be made numerical values can be different for example for a low carbon steel ultimate strength is almost 60 ksi under tensile load it can be different under compressive load but shape of diagram will be same similarly there will be a ultimate strength under compression ultimate uh, yielding strength under compression there will be elastic region there will be plastic region there will be strain hardening <coughs> okay but there will be no necking under compression load okay then we are further studying about modulus of elasticity under hooke's law as we have discussed that stress is equal to e into strain this is hooke's law this is applicable only to the elastic region this law cannot be applied beyond yield strength this is applicable only before the yield limit before the yield strength point okay now if we see <coughs> there there are stress strain diagrams for different alloys of steel of iron actually we can see the first one is for pure iron then is then there is for carbon steel a36 then there is high strength low alloy steel a992 there are different grades of steel actually a992 is a grade of steel a36 is a grade of steel then there is quenched tempered alloy steel now 
what is the difference between all of them pure and is pure iron is pure okay then carbon steel is an <coughs> uh, is a different grade of steel then uh, high strength low alloy steel is an alloy of steel then quenched tempered alloy steel is again a uh, heat treated alloy of steel we have uh, treated it uh, uh, with tempering and then quenching you know what is uh, tempering and quenching just simply heating up a material at certain temperature and then cooling it down in the quenching we can simply cool down them uh, cool down a material in in an oven so under different heat treatment can you know it from your basic knowledge of engineering materials material science sorry so by applying different heat treatment conditions and different heat treatment processes are by alloying the material or by applying different manufacturing processes what we can do with the material we can see for all the grades of steel this initial line this line is same the slope of the line is always same slope is e which is sigma over epsilon so for all the grades of steel either manufactured through different manufacturing process or different alloys of steel are uh, heat treated with different processes or untreated um, alloy of steel for all of them e is same e is slope of this initial line and slope of the line is same for all of them but we can see this is sigma yield this is sigma yield for the different grade this is sigma yield for high strength low alloy steel this is sigma yield for quenched tempered low alloy steel for all of the for all different grades of steel sigma yield is different so yield strength is different similarly sigma ultimate for pure iron sigma ultimate for carbon steel sigma ultimate for high strength low alloy steel and sigma ultimate for quenched tempered low alloy steel is different so yield strength and sigma strength uh, ultimate strengths are different similarly rupture strength is different similarly elongation elongation or strain at rupture is different these values are different so we can say that <coughs> strength ultimate strength or yield strength <coughs> even strain it can be affected by alloying heat treating and manufacturing processes but e modulus of elasticity cannot be changed cannot be affected so modulus of elasticity or stiffness modulus of elasticity of a material is actually calculated from the stiffness of the material stiffness is force divided by def uh, de uh, deformation this is again by hooke's law and modulus of elasticity is stress divided by strain they both are resistance against deformation k mod uh, stiffness is resistance against deformation e is resistance against strain okay so resist stiffness or modulus of elasticity of a material cannot be changed using alloying heat treatment or manufacturing processes but strength can be changed even strain can be changed okay so next topic is elastic versus plastic behavior we have detailed uh, discussed in detail that uh, what is elasticity and what is elastic limit what is plastic region and what is plastic behavior again if the strain disappears when stress is removed the material is said to behave elastically for example in this stress strain diagram before point b if we remove the load the material will return to its original position and it will behave elastically this behavior is called elastic behavior the largest stress for which this occurs is called elastic limit so this point b here below which this stress will the, the material will return to its original position after remover after removing the load this point is called elastic limit we also call it uh, yield limit or yield strength when the strain does not return to zero 
after the stress is removed the material is said to behave plastically beyond this point b at any point for example at point c if we remove the load this material will return to point d at point d strain is not zero we can see that on the horizontal axis there is some strain at point d this much strain this permanent strain is called residual strain there is no stress at this point at point b sigma is zero because sigma lies at the vertical axis and point d is on the horizontal axis so at point d sigma is zero there is no stress but there is no strain but there is strain actually so there is a per there is permanent deformation if there is strain it means there is deformation so in the absence of stress if there is strain it, that strain is actually permanent strain this is the strain exists without external load without stress so the such kind of material uh, is called to behave plastically and this region after point b tail point ultimate this is plastic region and the behavior of the material is called plastic behavior but before point b the behavior is called elastic behavior okay our next topic is fatigue fatigue is actually failure of a material under uh, cyclic loading under repeated load previously we have discussed failure behavior of a material or a behavior of a material under static loading the stress strain diagram discussed earlier was behavior of a material under static load static tensile or static compressive load but if the load is not static if it is repeated if it is cyclic then the behavior will be different at different number of cycles the material may fail at different uh, values of stress under under normal loading normal static load a material fractures are permanently uh, uh, fails at two different uh, permanent eddy forms at two different values of stress uh, it permanently uh, deforms at yield strength or sigma y yield stress and uh, it fractures after ultimate strength similarly a brittle material will fracture after ultimate strength if the load is below the ultimate uh, stress the brittle material will not fail and if the load is below the yield limit of a ductile material the material will not deform permanently but sometimes the material may fail even before the yield stress a ductile material may fail or even may fracture before this yield stress it may fracture somewhere in this region in this elastic region here or a brittle material may fail before before ultimate stress somewhere here or here or here at lower values of stress this is only possible if the load is not static if the load is repeated so such kind of failure is called fatigue failure here is a diagram given between stress and the number of cycles of the load the horizontal axis shows number of cycles of load and the vertical axis is stress so you can see uh, for example this curve is for steel 1020 grade of steel this grade of steel may fail at somewhere near 50 ksi around 45 ksi it may fail at number of loading cycle somewhere between 10 power 4 and 10 power 5 similarly it will fail at 40 ksi of stress at about 10 power 5 number of loads of uh, uh, number of loads so this is not a static load in static uh, under static load the number of cycles are uh, the number of cycles is just single one uh, equal to one but uh, if the number of cycles are about 10 power 5 for steel 1020 it may fail at even uh, 40 ksi of stress so as soon as we increase the number of loads of the cycle we can see that the material will fail at even lower values of stress 
So the stress at which a material fails is inversely proportional to the number of loading cycles. At higher number of loading cycles, the material will fail at even lower values of stress. This value of stress will be even lesser than the yield strength of the material for ductile uh, materials and it will be lower than the ultimate for bitten materials because bitten materials do not uh, undergo yielding. So fatigue failure is even dangerous. Material may fail below uh, at a stress level below the defined strength, below the defined static strength of the material. Okay. So a member may fail due to fatigue at a stress level significantly below the ultimate strength if subjected to many loading cycles. Below the ultimate strength, it can be even below the yield strength for a ductile material at a very high number of loading cycles. Okay. So at higher number of loading cycles, the failure stress is low. Then the if, if we if we look at this curve, this SN curve between stress and number of cycles, we can see that this curve has got flattened horizontally at some level, for example at 30 KSI, it has flattened at around 10 power 7 number of cycles. After this, uh, for any number of cycles above 10 power 7, for example at 10 power 8 or 10 power 9, the failure stress is the same it is uh, 30 ksi for this specific material of steel so this 30 ksi is actually the endurance limit of this material if the stress is below 30 ksi if it is like 20 ksi so this line this horizontal line of 20 K, uh, of 20 ksi stress does not touch this curve of steel sn curve of steel 1020 it means steel 1020 is safe for a safe at any value of stress below 30 ksi any value of stress below 30 ksi does not touch this curve for any number of loading cycles so 30 ksi is the fatigue strength of this material or endurance strength of this material endurance strength or fatigue strength is the value of stress below which a material will never fail under fatigue loading for any number of loading cycles. So endurance limit is a very important parameter for fatigue loading or for fatigue failure. For all the materials, there's, uh, diff there are different SN curves or different fatigue behavior and for all of them, we have a fatigue limit or endurance limit. So for fatigue loading, endurance limit is an important parameter. But we will not discuss fatigue, fatigue uh, the topic of fatigue in this course in detail for introduction purpose this slide was enough just to introduce I will repeat again fatigue is a failure of material under cyclic load or under repeated load the number of cycles of load is important and the stress at which uh, a material will fail under fatigue loading depends upon the number of cycles at higher number of cycles a, a material will fail at lower values of stresses uh, and there is a there is always a value be, of stress below which a material will not fail for any number of loading cycles theoretically it is true and that value of stress is called endurance limit or endurance uh, strength or fatigue strength of the material okay the next topic is deformations under axial loading so whenever we apply again we are back to the static load normal load um, whenever we apply normal load the material deforms the length of the material which was initially l it deforms and the change is delta how to find this change we will use Hooke's law and now we will di discuss about um, elastic failures only from now onwards <clears throat> so to find deformation within elastic limit if a material is not uh, deformed plastically within the elastic limit we can use Hooke's law which is sigma is equal to e into strain or we can write it as strain is equal to deformation divided by length sorry uh, it is equal to stress divided by e or we can write stress as 
P over A it, because it is a normal load so we can write it P over A divided by E okay sigma has been replaced with P over A we also know that strain is equal to deformation divided by initial length if we compare these two expressions they both are equal to strain normal strain so we can write it as del over length is equal to P over AE and if we rearrange this we can write as deformation is equal to PL over AE so deformation of any bar can be calculated under normal load can be calculated using this expression load into length divided by cross section area uh, and uh, divided by mm, modulus of elasticity of the material so deformation here depends upon load P length and area is geometry load geometry and material material property here is e. so deformation depends upon these three parameters load or loading geometry of the bar and material if any one of them is <coughs> changing so we uh, if for example we have a bar where area is consistently changing here the cross section area is a1 here construction area is a2 and if the load is constant so we have uh, l1 and l2 even if the material is different e1 and e2 it can be same or it can be different so we will uh, we will uh, calculate individual deformations in each of the part in part 1 and part 2 and then we can add them up so the net deformation will be sum of the individual deformations Sorry. pi li over ai yeah. here we will section this uh, bar to find load p in this section and then load p it can be different in different sections in this case it is same but it can be different we will solve some example problems on this topic and you can understand how we can find and delta if the area is changing or if the material is changing or if the load is changing or if all of them are changing at the same time here is the example this is a detailed example where area is uh, <coughs> changing consistently with the length continuously with the length and also the loads are changed <coughs> we can see here area is changing here load there are three different loads at three different points lengths are given e is same throughout 29 to 10 power 6 psi d capital d is this diameter and small d is this diameter one uh, capital d is 1.07 inches and small d is 0.618 inch determine the deformation of the steel rod shown under the given loads okay so we have the expression Sorry. we have this expression deformation is equal to summation of individual deformations we will find p in each of the section length area and e to find p we have to find uh, the change in load along the length of the bar we will start from the free end and we will section it we will section the um, this bar where, wherever the load changes or wherever the area changes or wherever the material changes along the length along the length we will change this load wherever the area changes or wherever the material uh, load changes or wherever the material changes so in this case material is constant it is same but area is changing and similarly load is changing at three different points so we will we usually start from we usually start from the free end so at the free end 
analysis uh, a b c d at uh, point a it is fixed at point d it is free at free end there is a 30 kilopounds force at point c there is a 45 kilopounds force and at point b it is 75 kilopounds of force <coughs> area is also changing from uh, at point c we will start at d at d we have 30 kilopounds force going from the free end towards the fixed end area changes at point c so before that we will section this uh, bar then at c area changes as well as the load changes again going from c towards b area is constant but load changes at b so we will section the bar between b and c Again, going from B till A, area is constant, but at point A, it is fixed. So at fixed end, we have reaction forces. There will be a reaction force here. So again, we will section it between A and B. <clears throat> we will section the bar between two points, wherever the load changes or the area changes or the material changes. <clears throat> so we have total three sections, section 1, 2, and 3. We will draw individually individual free body diagrams uh, at each section. If we section this beam, this uh, bar at point uh, at section three, so we will draw its free body di diagram here. At point D, we have 30 kilopounds of force, and at section uh, three, where uh, where we have uh, sectioned it, there must be a reaction force, and we are calling it P3. Similarly, at Section 2, we have drawn a free body diagram, whatever is on the right side of it, you can also draw it and draw the left side of it, whichever you follow. So at section 2, we have a reaction force, all of the other forces are given. Similarly, if we section it at, point, at, at 1, so all the forces on the right side are given forces known forces and at section 1 we have a reaction force which is unknown so we have three reaction forces p1 p2 and p3 in three different sections section 1 2 and 3 we can find these forces summation of forces is equal to 0 so for this section 3 p3 minus 30 is equal to 0 so p3 is equal to 30 kilopounds similarly for section 2, P2 plus 45 minus 30 is equal to 0. The forces in same direction will have same sign. In the opposite direction, they will have different signs. So P2 will be equal to minus 15 kilopounds. Similarly, we can find P3. So P2, P3 and P4 have been calculated. P1 is 60 kilopounds are 16 to 10 power 3 pounds p2 is minus 15 kilopounds and p3 is 30 kilopounds okay now we know p1 p2 and p3 a1 a2 and a3 section 1 has a diameter capital d given to us section 2 also has the same diameter so a1 and a2 will be same section 3 has a smaller diameter small d it is also given to us so from diameter we can find uh, areas a1 and a2 both are same pi by 4 capital d square and a3 is pi by 4 small d square capital d and small d are given to us so we can calculate a1 and a2 and a3 a1 is a1 and a2 both are 0 0.9 square inch and a3 is 0 0.3 square inch L1, L2 and L3 are given to us already in the given statement. L1 is 12 inches, L2 is 12 inches and L3 is 16 inches. Length L is the length between the two points where we have, uh, those two, two points between which we have uh, sectioned the bar. So L1 and L2 both are given to us as 12 inches and L3 is given to us as 16 inches. E is same for all of the sections, material is same, E1, E2 and A3, all of them are simply 29 into 10 power 6 PSI 
it is given to us in the problem so net deformation is p1 l1 over a1 e1 p2 l2 over a2 e2 plus e, uh, p3 l3 over a3 e3 e is common because e is constant so we can put the values here and after calculations delta our deformation is 75.9 into 10 power minus 3 inches this was required in the problem and we have calculated it this is very simple you have to use this expression del is equal to summation of p i l i a i e i okay moving next we have another sample problem sample problem 2.1 from the textbook the rigid bar b d e is supported by two links a b and c d so here is a rigid bar it cannot be deformed it is rigid and it is supported with two links uh, a b and c d now the a b and c d are not specified as rigid so it means they are deformable they are not rigid we can find deformation in a b and c d what is required okay here is a load of 30 kN at point e link a b is made of aluminum and e modulus of elasticity is 70 gigapascal so if there is a value of e for a material it means it is deformable material it is not rigid a b is not rigid and a b has a cross sectional area of 500 meters square so in the third dimension which is not visible to us in this diagram this bar has a has an area which is 500 millimeter square link c d is also made of uh, it is made of steel and uh, modulus of elasticity of steel is given to us 200 gigapascal and it has a cross sectional area of 600 millimeter square so area for both the bars is given uh, modulus of elasticity e for both the bars is given and uh, length of both the bars is known a b is 0 0.3 meter and c d is 0 0.4 meters what is required under this load of 30 kN force determine the deflection in b d and e deflection means uh, how much they have moved uh, it is fixed both the bars are fixed at the top ends and uh, the bar a b is fixed at a and bar c d is fixed at c so at the fixed end they cannot move but at the other end at and b and d they can either come down or they can move up either coming down or moving up whatever it is so we will first find either they are uh, in tension or compression either both of them are can be in tension or both of them can be in compression or one of them can be in tension or the other one in compression so the the, the the amount this point b moves towards a or moves away from a it is the deformation in this bar a b similarly the amount the point d moves towards c or away from c it will be deformation in the rod in the bar c d so simply we have to find deformation in bar a b and deformation in bar c d it will be the displacement of point b and point d respectively and again we have to find deformation not deflection in point e as well so how much this point e moves we will find it later on using uh, trigonometry so first we will find del a b which will be deflection in point b del c d deformation in rod c d will be equal to deflection of point d and from these two values how we find deflection of point e we will use trigonometry so let us see how we can do because there is no deformable bar attached to point e so we cannot use this deformation formula okay deformation in point a in rod a b uh, del b will be equal to force in a b length of a b divided by area of a b and e of a b length of a b is known to us which is 0 0.3 meter area of ab is given to us in the problem statement e modulus of elasticity of ab aluminum is given to us so we have to find force in ab pab similarly for cd we we know all of the other uh, parameters we know we need to know pcd so the load in ab and cd can be found using equations of statics 
laws of statics. First, we will draw a free body diagram of this rigid bar BDE. The free body diagram of rigid bar BDE can be drawn like at point E, we have a downward force of 30 kN. At point D and B, we are assuming that there are two reaction forces. FAB or PAB and FCD or PCD, whatever you represent it, however you represent it. Initially, I have assumed that the direction of these two arrow arrows are upward. They are away from the bar BDE. So, away from the bar BDE means I am assuming that both of these forces are tensile. This is my assumption. If my assumption is wrong, so after calculation, the numerical values will be in the neg with, with negative sign. If the sign of the force is positive, it means our assumptions were correct. So initially, I've assumed that both these forces are tensile. They are away from the body. Here, we can use equations of statics because we know these lengths. Here it is. Okay. There are two unknowns, FAB and FCD. So two unknowns can be calculated using equations of equilibrium. First, we are taking moment, summation of moments at point B equal to zero. So there are two forces, FCD and 30 kN. Both of them are producing moment. <coughs> if I assume that counterclockwise moment is positive, so FCD into its distance from point B. Similarly, 30 kN is producing clockwise moment minus 30 kN into its distance from point B, which is 0 0.2 plus 0 0.4, it is 0 0.6. So FCD becomes 90 kN with a positive value. So positive value means the direction I have assumed here, it is correct. It is under tension. The bar CD is under tension. Okay. Similarly, it is under tension because I have assumed it under tension and the value is positive, value of the force, so it means my assumption is correct. Summation of forces is equal to zero. I can write it as FCD plus FAB minus 30 is equal to zero. Or I can use, alternatively, I can use summation of moments at point D. Uh, you can either use this expression or this expression take um, sum of all the moments at point D and you can calculate FAB and it comes out to be minus 60 kN. If it is minus 60 kN, the negative sign means this direction which I have assumed, it is incorrect. We have to change the direction. I have assumed FAB as a tensile force away from this rod. So it means it is wrong. It, it should be a compressive one. Okay, some students usually get confused that uh, this force AB is towards the now the new direction which is defined here it is compressive so it is towards the this bar this rigid bar so it means some of the students think it means it is towards the uh, bar so the force is downward it is not correct compression means if the bar if the bar AB is under compression so it is applying a compressive force on this rigid bar. In response, the rigid bar will apply a compressive force on the rod AB or the bar AB. Similarly, if the rod CD or if the bar CD is under tension, so it is applying a tensile force on the rigid bar BDE and the rigid bar BDE is applying a, 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 a applying a reaction force as a tensile force on rod C, uh, bar CD. So FCD is in 90 kN tension, FAB is in uh, compression, it is minus 60 kN. Now we know both the forces already. We have this expression del B or del AB is equal to PAB or FAB, length of AB, area of AB, E of AB. This PAB is force in AB, which we have calculated here is FAB. We should have used here PAB actually. Okay. 
So by putting all the values, length, area, and E were already known to us. P has been calculated as minus 60 kilonewton, minus 16 into 10 power 3 newtons. So the value value comes out to be minus 514 into 10 power minus 6 meters. Minus 514 into 10 power minus 6 means this rod, a, the bar AB is under compression. If the bar AB is under compression, it means this point B will move towards A. Compression means the length decreases, so it will move towards a fixed point. So it is moving upward actually, point B. So here we have mentioned here 0.514 millimeter deformation upward with the upward sign. Similarly, del D is actually deformation in rod, uh, in bar CD. It will be PCD, RFCD, length of CD, area of CD, and E of CD by putting all the values. Length, area, and E were already known to us. P has been calculated recently as 19 to 10 power 3 newtons by putting all the values. Del D becomes 13 to 10 power minus 6 meters. It is positive, it means the, rod, the bar CD is under tension. If the bar CD is under tension, it means this point D will move away from point C, the fixed end. So it will come downwards. So here we have shown a downward sign. So now we know that how much the point B has moved upward and how much the point D has moved downward. Okay, initially B, D and E. It's like this, it is horizontal. B has moved upward, D has moved downward, it is rigid. So this is delta B, this is B has moved to B dash, D has moved to D dash, here delta D, and E will come down to E dash. This delta E we have to calculate in the third part of the problem. We can use trigonometry because we have three similar triangles here. If I call it as point H, here it is drawn here. This intersection point is point H. We have three triangles, triangle HBB dash, triangle HDD dash, and triangle HEE dash. These three triangles are similar triangles because their corresponding angles are equal. So we know from trigonometry that if, this, if two triangles are similar, the ratio of their corresponding sides will be same. We do not know this the location of point H. So let us call it X. HD length is X. So BD is given to us already in the problem. It is 200 mm. So this remaining length will be 200 minus X. So let us find X first. So from these two triangles, HBB dash and HDG dash, they are similar triangles. So we can find this length H if we get, uh, if we use the ratio of their corresponding sides. Ratio of the corresponding sides will be equal. BB dash divided by DD dash will be equal to BH divided by DH or HD. So the given values are BB dash is equal to delta B and DD dash is equal to delta D. We can simply put the values here and we can find X. Now the X is known to us. So we can compare the two triangles. HDD dash, now the length X is known to us. HDD dash and HEE dash. From these two triangles, using the ratios of the corresponding side, we can use this side as well. We can find delta E. This is unknown to us. So EE dash divided by DD dash is equal to HE divided by HD. You know the trigonometry very well from the for, from your previous mathematics courses. So you can find EE dash is actually equal to delta E, this one. All of the other values are known to us. So delta E can be calculated as 1.928 millimeters and E has moved downward so we have shown a downward sign here okay so we were required to find deflections of point B D and E the deflection of B is actually due to deformation in rod uh, bar AB deflection of D is due to deformation in rod CD and deflection of E is actually the due to the rotation of the rigid bar BDE and we have calculated it through trigonometry 
I hope the concept is clear to you. I will move forward. The next topic is static indeterminacy. What is indeterminacy? Something that cannot be solved and cannot be determined. So static indeterminacy means something that cannot be solved using equations of statics. Equations of statics are equations of equilibrium. In two dimensions, we have three equations of equilibrium. Summation of forces in horizontal direction is equal to zero. Summation of forces in vertical direction is equal to zero. And summation of moment in the plane, in the two-dimensional plane, is zero. Okay. So using these three equations, we can only find three unknowns. We cannot find four unknowns using three equations. So if the number of unknown reaction forces in a problem is more than number of equations, we cannot solve it using equations of equilibrium or equations of statics. So such kind of problem is called statically indeterminate problem. For these two, remember that for these equations, from these three equations, we can find three unknowns, but one of them should be in the horizontal direction and the other two can be uh, in any other two directions. One force can be in the horizontal, two can be in the vertical, or one can be in the vertical, two can be in the horizontal. We cannot find all the forces in one direction. Okay. Now, here this problem is given to us. Two forces are known, 30 kN, 300 kN, and 600 kN. If we draw a free body diagram here, here is the free body diagram. There will be one reaction force at point A, R A, and one reaction force at B where it is resting, R B. So there are two unknown reaction forces. We cannot use equation of forces in horizontal direction because there is no force in horizontal direction. We cannot use this expression. We can use this expression. Okay, both unknown forces are in vertical direction. One of the expression. We cannot use this expression because there is no moment. All these forces, all of the three given forces, for, uh, given forces and reaction forces are in a single direction, single line of action. So if the forces are in a single line of action, in the same line of action, they cannot produce any moment. So we cannot use the equation of moment. For moment, we need to have offset distance between the two forces. So there is no offset distance, so we cannot use the equation of moments. We have only one equation of equilibrium but we have two unknowns R A and R B so this problem is statically indeterminate. Now what we can do here one of these two reaction forces R A and R B is redundant reaction. Redundant means we do not need that reaction force to keep the body in equilibrium. Even if this there was no support at point B this body was still in equilibrium due to the support at point A or even if there was a reaction force or if there was a support at point B but there was no support at point A still the body would have been in equilibrium because of support at point B so one of these reaction forces is redundant reaction it depends upon us whichever we call redundant okay so we will denote one or nominate one of the reaction force as redundant reaction and then we will treat that reaction as a load. Reaction is actually internal, but we will keep, we will treat it as a external load. Okay. How we will do? First, we will remove the redundant reaction. In this case, what we have done, we have removed this redundant reaction in the first part. There is only one reaction at point A. There is no reaction at point B. So the applied forces of 300 kilonewton and 600 kilonewton it will elongate this body downward and there will be a deformation of delta L because we have removed the reaction at point P. In the next step, we will remove the applied loads of 300 kilonewton and 600 kilonewton. In this case, we have removed the applied loads and we have applied the redundant reaction which was previously removed in the previous step. We have applied it as a, as a load now. So this redundant reaction is a compressive load in this case and it is pushing back the, uh, this body and it is pushing it back 
and this uh, compressive deformation is del R. There are two deformation. One deformation due to the applied loads, 300 and 600 kN Newton, and the other one is due to the redundant reaction, which is a compressive one, uh, del R. These two deformations are equal but opposite because at the end, this body has no deformation. It is fixed at both the ends. Uh, there is the net deformation is zero. So the sum of these two deformations, del L and del R, is zero. In some other case, it can be a positive number if the given deformation is not zero. It should be given in the problem. Either it is a positive deformation or it is a negative deformation. Currently, there is no deformation. So summation of del L and del R is zero. Net deformation is zero. So we have got an extra equation. Previously, we had only one equation. Summation of forces is equal to zero in vertical direction. Now we have another equation. Del L plus del R is equal to zero. So using these two equations, we can now find two unknowns. So now the problem can be solved. Okay, we will solve this problem on the next slide. The same problem, example 2.04. Determine the reactions at point A and B for the steel bar and loading shown. Assume a close fit at both supports before the loads are applied. Close fit means this body is touched with the support at A and it is already pinned at B. Close fit means there can be no deformation. There is no space for the deformation. Okay, so net deformation is zero. Close fit means like this. If there is no close fit, the deformation, the net deformation will be given in the statement of the problem. It can be a positive deformation or negative. Okay. <clears throat> now, we have two reaction forces as discussed earlier, RB and RA. We cannot solve it using equations of statics. So what we will do, we will treat this RB as an external load. First, we will remove this RB and we will find del L due to the applied loads of 300 kN and 600 kN. And then we will remove the two loads. In the first case, we will find del L. In the second case, we will remove the applied loads 300 and 600 kilonewtons and we will apply RB as a compressive force and to find del R. Okay, in the first case, and okay, after that we will add the two deformations del L and del R and we will keep the addition, the sum equal to zero to get an extra equation. Okay, in the first case, we have to know the force in each section, area of each section and length of each section. <coughs> Starting from the free end, from this end, there is no force on the free surface. As we move upward, the force comes here. So between these two points, we will section the beam, the, the bar. Then moving from here upward, the area changes at this point. So we will section the bar. Wherever the load changes or the area changes, we have to section this bar. <coughs> again, moving upward, the area is same, but the load changes at a point, so we will section again, and from here upward at the fixed point, till, till the fixed point, we have to section again. So we have uh, section 1, 2, 3, and 4. Similarly, for this diagram, there is a load at the free end. As we move upward, the load is constant. But the area changes here, so we will section it here, section 1, and then moving upward. Again, there is no load, but the area is constant. Load will change, or the new load is a reaction force here, so we will section it. Okay, we have four sections in the first case, two sections in the second case. We will solve the two cases individually, and then the sum will be equal to, sum of the deformations will be equal to zero. For section 1, length is 150 mm, load is zero. If I draw this section one, this one, there is no load at the free end. So at the section point, if I call it P1, reaction force, wherever we cut, we have to apply a reaction force. So summation of forces is equal to zero. Since there is no other force, so this P1 does not exist actually, it is zero. If I section it 
here and I draw it like this there is a force at point K 600 kilonewtons and there is a reaction force P2 summation of forces is equal to 0 so P2 is 600 kilonewton actually and it is tensile because the sign will be positive similarly if I section it here in 3 at section 3 and I draw a free body diagram at point K there is a force of 600 kilonewtons and at section 3 there is P3 so P3 is again equal to 600 kilonewtons there is no other force and if I section the body at 4 and draw a free body diagram there is a force at point K and then there is another force at point D now the point D is included in the free body diagram here is P4 so summation of forces is equal to 0 and P4 becomes 900 kilonewtons so P1, P2, P3 and P4 are known in the first diagram <coughs> A1 and A2 are given in the problem in this problem it is given A1, this is A1 A2, A1, A2 this is section 1 section 2 they both are same similarly a3 and a4 is same uh, 250 mm square a1 and a2 are given a3 and a4 are given l1 l2 l3 and l4 are also given this is l1 l2 l3 and all of them are equal to 150 mm e is same throughout it is not known to us in this problem so we will use it as e summation of <coughs> We will use this equation of summation. So del L is equal to PI L I A I E I. It will be like 1 over E. E is constant. P1 L1 over A1 plus P2 L2 over A2. Remember that if any of the load is negative, we have to use it as negative. The deformation will be compressive and it will be subtracted from the net deformation. Okay. So we have got del L equal to 1.125 into 10 power 9 divided by E. Similarly from the next diagram here, we will section it between point B and C because there is no load but there is a change of area at point C. So here is RB and here will be P1 because it is RB is compressive so I have denoted P1 as compressive and P1 for this case is equal to RB. Similarly, if I section it at 2, so P2 will be compressive again and P2 is also equal to RB, it is compressive. Remember that this P1 and P2 in this section, they are not the same as P1 and P2 in the previous section. If you are getting confused with it, you can denote them with section 5 and 6, P5 and P6. Anyways, the P1 and P2 both are equal to minus RB actually which is compressive A1 and A2 now we have two areas only we have two sections actually so first section area A1 and A2 they are known to us from the statement of the problem similarly L1 in this case is length of this whole section between B and C and L2 is between C and A both are 300 mm each are 0 0.3 mm, uh, meters now summation in this case is 1 over E into P1 L1 divided by A1 plus P2 L2 divided by A2. So del R becomes minus 1.95 into 10 power 3 multiplied by RB divided by E. Now we have two deformations del L and del R. Some of them should be equal to 0. So del L plus del R is uh, the sum of them is equal to zero. There is only one unknown. If we put the values, there is unknown R B. Okay, we can keep E as constant. The ratio is equal to zero, so E cannot be equal to zero, and uh, because it is divided by E, and uh, E is a material property, so definitely it is not equal to zero. So R B has been calculated it is 577 into 10 power minus 3 newtons or 577 kilonewtons 
Now the RB is known to us. If RB is known to us from this diagram, if RB is known, so there is only one unknown and we can find it using equations of equilibrium. Now it is statically determinate. Summation of Fy is equal to 0. So Fy will be 323. Put all the values 323 kilonewtons. So we have calculated both the reaction forces RA and RB. Okay. I hope uh, the concepts are clear and if there is any query you can ask me through email. Okay, the next topic is thermal stresses. As evident from its name, thermal stress is due to a thermal change and due to increase or decrease in temperature. Due to increase in temperature, the materials usually expand and due to decrease in temperature, the materials contract. This expansion, expansion in the length or volume and contraction is is deformation and dividing that deformation by the by the initial length is a normal strain so as soon as the material expand or contract there is a normal strain tensile strain or compression strain which is called thermal strain because it is due to the change in temperature if a material is allowed to expand freely or contract freely due to a change in temperature so it will have a thermal strain but there will be no thermal stress because we, there is no restriction it is expanding or contracting freely so in order to uh, have a thermal stress we need to stop that thermal expansion or thermal contraction just like uh, this figure a member has been constrained from the two ends and A and NB if there is a thermal change if the temperature increases this bar cannot expand in the horizontal direction so there will be a thermal stress in the horizontal direction but there will be no thermal strain because we have stopped that uh, expansion similarly if we stop a contraction there will be a there will be no thermal strain again and there will be thermal stress so there is no stress associated with the thermal strain unless elongation is restrained by the supports so we have to stop the free expansion and free contraction due to temperature change in order to have thermal stress. Again, a problem of thermal stress is like a statically indeterminate problem. We, we can see in this diagram and the bar is constrained or restricted from both ends. There are reaction forces on both ends and, and the number of reaction forces are more than the number of equilibrium equations. And the problem is statically indeterminate. There will be two unknown reaction forces at the end. These two constraints are applying a compressive. If the temperature is increasing, for example, the bar will try to expand and the two constraints at the end will try to compress back, compress it back to the original length. So there is a compressive force at the two ends. This, these two compressive forces, RA and RB, are unknown because they are two, so we cannot find it using summation of forces in x direction we have only one equation in this case and using this equilibrium equation we cannot solve this problem we cannot uh, calculate these two reaction forces so what we have to do just like the previous topic we will consider one of the reaction as a redundant reaction for example the rb is a redundant reaction so we have removed this redundant reaction from b and we we have let the bar expand freely in the horizontal direction uh, from the end B so under an increase in temperature it will expand by an amount of delta T thermal deformation this delta T will be equal to alpha delta T L alpha is coefficient of thermal expansion delta T is the change in temperature and L is its initial length okay now what we do after calculating this delta T change in temperature, a change in length due to temperature, deformation due to temperature, what we do, we have to apply the redundant reaction as a force, the compressive force P in the next step. And this compressive force will compress the bar AB again to its original length L. This compression is del P, which is due to the force. And previously we have studied that 
deformation due to force is equal to P L over A E. In the beginning of this chapter, we have derived this expression. So this deformation del P is due to the applied force P, which was resultant, uh, which was actually due to the reaction at point B, and this del T is uh, deformation due to thermal change due to temperature. Now, at the end, we know that there is no increase or decrease in the length of the bar. The net deformation is zero because it is fixed from both ends. So sum of these two deformations, del T and del P, must be equal to zero. The net deformation, which is sum of del T plus del P, is equal to zero. So by inserting the uh, expressions, del T is equal to alpha delta T L plus del P is equal to P L over A E is equal to zero. So we can calculate force from here. P is equal to minus A E alpha delta T. Negative sign means this force is compressive which is definitely a compressive force. It is trying to stop a expansion, so it must be a compressive force. This compressive force is equal to minus area into modulus of elasticity into coefficient of thermal expansion into change in temperature. Del T is the net change in temperature. If we divide this force by area, so we can find thermal stress, which is equal to force divided, it is a kind of normal stress, so it is equal to P over A by dividing this force P over area, so we will get minus E alpha delta T. This is thermal stress, which is compressive in the nature against a thermal expansion, against an increase in temperature. Similarly, the same expression will, can be derived for a tensile force against a thermal compression there will be no negative sign, the expression will be similar. Okay, so we can calculate thermal stresses in the same way, just like we have done, uh, we have uh, followed a procedure for a statically indeterminate problems. Well, the next topic is Poisson's ratio. It is a very important parameter, Poisson's ratio. It is uh, defined for ductile materials, usually. Uh, a slender bar is shown in the diagram and force is being applied in the horizontal direction, x direction. So there will be stress in the uh, x direction and strain in the x direction. There is no stress or no force in the y, y and z direction. So initially we think like there is no deformation or no strain in the y and z direction. We just define strain in the x direction is sigma x over e, which is Hooke's law. We are just discussing about elastic deformation only. There is no stress in the y and z direction because there is no force in the y and z direction. Okay. The elongation in the x direction is accompanied by a contraction in the other two directions, assuming that the material is isotropic. Isotropic means there is no directional dependent property. So there is stress in the x direction. There is no stress in the y and z direction. But due to the expansion in the x direction, there will be contraction in the y and z directions. This is, uh, this property is a property of uh, deformable materials, uh, ductile materials specifically. So, remember that whenever we apply or whenever we deform a material in one of the three, three directions, it will have, it will experience an opposite deformation in the other two directions. If the deformation in x direction, the applied deformation is tensile, so there will be compression in the y and z direction. And if the applied deformation in the x direction is compressive, so there will be tension in the y and z directions. So there is zero stress in the y and z direction, but there is not a zero strain in the y and z direction. Due to the stress in the x direction, sigma x, which is equal to P over A, due to the stress in x direction, there is strain in the y and z direction. So we call this strain as lateral strain. The stress, the strain in the axial direction or the direction of force is called axial strain and the strain in the uh, other two directions uh, is called lateral strain. 
So this strength epsilon y and epsilon z due to the stress in x direction will be same. Epsilon y and epsilon z are strain in the y and strain in the z direction will be same. The compression in the y and z direction, uh, not the compression actually, the compressive strain in the y and z direction will be same and it will not be equal to zero. So we here we define a, a, a new parameter and which is called Poisson's ratio. It is a ratio of two strains. The lateral strain divided by the axial strain. The lateral strain which has been produced due to the axial strain. So lateral strain divided by the axial strain. Axial strain is produced directly due to the axial load and lateral strain is a result of the axial strain. These two will always be in the opposite direction. If the axial strain is tensile, the lateral strain will be compressive. And if the axial strain is compressive, the lateral strain will be tensile. Okay, so this Poisson's ratio must be a positive number. That is why we have kept it in uh, in the two uh, absolute uh, in the two lines, vertical lines, absolute uh, lines. And one of the lateral or axial strain must be compressive. If the axial strain is uh, tensile, lateral will be compressive. If the lateral strain is tensile axial strain will be compressive. So one of them will be negative. So the total number, the total ratio comes out to be negative. So that is why we are multiplying it with a negative sign so that the total becomes or the net value becomes positive. One of the epsilon y or epsilon x will be negative, compressive. So by multiplying that negative with a negative sign, it will be positive. Similarly, strain in y divided by strain x or strain in z divided by strain in x ratio will be same because this number strain in y and strain in z these two strains are same okay so we will use this uh, Poisson's ratio this concept in our uh, upcoming topics this is a very important topic okay now we are going to use it previously we have discussed that Due to stress in the axial direction, one of the axial direction, for example in the x direction, there will be stress P over A and there will be strain del over L. Okay, now in the x direction there is strain due to the force in y direction as well as due to the force in z direction. If there is force in z direction and y direction, there will be strain in the x direction as well. So how can we define it in a Hooke's law? Previously the Hooke's law was defined for a single direction only. For example, strain in x direction is equal to stress in x direction divided by modulus of elasticity. This component of strain is only due to the force or the stress in the x direction but there will be contribution of forces in the y and z directions as well. So we can write it like this. The strain in the x direction is due to three components of loads or three, three components of stress. Due to the stress in x direction, it is sigma x divided by E minus due to the strain in y direction. So it will be a multiple of Poisson's ratio which has been defined in the previous topic, minus the strain due to z stress, stress in the z direction. It will again will be multiplied with the uh, Poisson's ratio. So <clears throat> the negative sign means this deformation, deformation will be in the opposite direction. Okay. Similarly, strain in y is because of the stress in y direction, minus the stress in the x direction, minus the stress in the z direction. Similarly, strain in z direction is due to stress in z direction, minus the stress in y direction, minus the stress in x direction. So these three expressions are actually Hooke's law in three dimension, which is called, it is called generalized Hooke's law. So now from now onwards, if we want to calculate components of strain in the three dimensions, or one of the three dimensions, x, y, and z, we need to use Poisson's ratio and the three dimensional stresses, normal stresses, sigma x, sigma y and sigma z to calculate each component of the strain.
we will use it in our next topic which is dilatation or bulk modulus again bulk modulus is another important concept <coughs> bulk modulus or dilatation dilatation is actually uh, resistance against volumetric change resistance against volumetric strain just like the Young's modulus or modulus of elasticity is resistance against normal strain. So similarly, dilatation is resistance against volumetric strain or change in volume. Here we have a cube with the sides, which each with each side uh, having unit length one. The net volume will be one into one into one, which is one again unit volume. Okay, after applying stresses in the three directions, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, the change in volume or the, new, the side, length of the new sides will be 1 plus epsilon x, 1 plus epsilon y, and 1 plus epsilon z. Epsilon x, epsilon y, and epsilon z are the change in length. Okay, so the new, the new volume in this case is... 1 plus epsilon x multiplied by 1 plus epsilon y multiplied by 1 plus epsilon z. So the final volume minus initial volume is the change in volume. Okay. The change in volume is equal to the final volume. minus the initial volume so after simplifying this expression uh, by multiplying the different terms some terms will have product of different strains because epsilon x epsilon y and epsilon z these are very small number so their products product of two of the strains or three of the strains will be a very very small number so we will neglect those terms involving product of two or three strains so by simplifying it, the net volume will be, I will keep only the significant terms, 1 plus epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z. I have neglected the terms involving the product of the strains. So 1 and minus 1 can be cancelled out. So net change in volume is equal to epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z. Okay, this is change in volume. So dilatation, which is denoted with small e, it is equal to the change in volume per unit original volume. This is volumetric strain actually. So dilatation is volumetric strain and bulk modulus is resistance to the uh, volumetric change, resistance to the uh, change in volume. Previously I uh, stated that dilatation is resistance to the change in volume which is wrong. Dilatation is actually change in volume per unit original volume. Dilatation is actually volumetric strain. Bulk modulus is the resistance to volumetric change. So please uh, remember it. I have corrected my statement. Bulk modulus is resistance to the volumetric strain and dilatation is actually the volumetric strain. Okay, so it is equal to change in volume per unit original volume. So change in volume is here. Epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z. And original volume, which is initial volume, it is equal to 1 in this case. So anything divided by 1 will be the same. So E is actually equal to dilatation is equal to epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z. Sum of the strains in the three directions. Now if we put expressions of strains from the previous slide, from the generalized Hooke's law, uh, by putting the strains in terms of stresses, we can simplify this expression and dilatation or the volumetric change will be equal to, the small e is actually dilatation, is equal to sum of the strains and if we put the expressions of strains from the generalized Hooke's law, so it will be 
1 minus 2 nu divided by e. I have skipped the simplification terms. You can do it or you can see it in the textbook. Any of the textbooks are related to mechanics of material. So the dilatation or the volumetric strain or the change in volume per unit original volume is actually sum of the three dimensional normal strains or it is equal to 1 minus 2 nu divided by E multiplied by sum of the three normal stresses. Okay. Now, if we assume that a body or a cube, it is under a uniform hydrostatic pressure. Uniform hydrostatic pressure means the cube is under the same amount of pressure from the three sides. Hydrostatic pressure. Okay. So, the stresses in the three dimension, three directions, sigma x, sigma y and sigma z in this case are all equal to the pressure. So, I want to use this specific case for a hydrostatic pressure case. Okay, for this case, the dilatation is equal to 1 minus 2 nu divided by E into sum of the 3, sorry, this is minus P because hydrostatic pressure is compressive. So, minus P, minus P, minus P. So, it becomes minus 3P into 1 minus 2 nu over E. I can further simplify it as minus P divided by E over 3 into 1 minus 2 nu. Okay. So, this term E divided by 3 into 1 minus 2 nu this is actually a constant. All the terms are constant. So, I can replace it with a constant k. This k is actually equal to e divided by 3 into 1 minus 2 nu. This k is bulk modulus. This is bulk modulus. And this bulk modulus is actually inversely proportional to dilatation E. The lower the bulk modulus, the higher will be dilatation. So, the bulk modulus is a material property. If a material has lower bulk modulus, it will experience more dilatation, more volumetric strain under pressure. And if a material has higher bulk modulus, it will have lower volumetric strain. It will experience lower volumetric strain, strain against the same amount of pressure. So, it is actually resistance to volumetric strain or dilatation or a, uh, change in volume. Bulk modulus is resistance to change in volume or dilatation. Okay. In this case, uh, we have discussed, the, we have derived this expression of uh, bulk modulus for a compressive stress or compressive pressure case. In case of compressive pressure, the dilatation must be negative. The change in volume must be negative. It means this expression for E, it, it, must, it must yield a negative number. Here is a negative sign with the pressure. It means the value of K this E divided by 3 into 1 minus nu must be a positive number so that the net value of E is negative. So, for K to be positive, it is equal to E over 3 into 1 minus 2 nu. This ratio should be a positive number. If this is a positive number, E is already positive. It means 1 minus 2 nu should be positive. Okay. If this should be positive, it means nu should be greater than 
our two nu should be less than one or you can say nu should be less than one by two so Poisson's ratio should be less than one by two it cannot be greater than for any material this is a derived fact that Poisson ratio cannot be 1 by 2 or 0 0.5. The value of Poisson ratio will always be less than 0 0.5. It has no unit because it is ratio between two similar quantities between two strands. And it can also be not less than 0. Remember that Poisson ratio cannot be less than 0. It cannot be a negative number. Previously I have told you that Poisson's ratio must be a positive number. We have intentionally kept a negative sign in the expression, this negative sign, so that the ratio of two strands, one of them must be a compressive strand, so that the ratio becomes positive. So, Poisson ratio cannot be a negative number, so it should be greater than zero. It should be less than 0 0.5. So, Poisson ratio is something between 0 to 0 0.5. It is different for different materials. Okay, so we have studied about Poisson's ratio and then uh, bulk modulus, these two are two important constants which will be used in the subject of mechanics of material. The bulk modulus can also be used in fluid mechanics in your concept of fluid mechanics. Okay. Again, again our next topic is sharing strain Previously, we have discussed about normal strain. Normal strain is actually change in length, either tension or compression, increase in length or decrease in length. So, what is shear strain? Shear strain is actually change in shape. The angles of the sides are changed. In case of normal strain, the lengths of the sides of a cube are increased or decreased. But in case of shearing strain, the angles are changed. So a cubic element subjected to a shear stress will deform into a rhomboid and the corresponding shear strain is quantified in terms of the change in angle between the two sides. So the shear strain usually have a unit of radians because it is change in angle. So here you can see shear strains have been applied, shear forces have been applied on the sides of a cube. You can see tau xy and tau yx, they are both same in magnitude directions are different. Here is tau xy and tau yx. So they both, these two forces will just uh, change the angle of this edge. Similarly these two forces will change the angle of this edge. So you can see change in angle at the edges, the adjacent sides so at the two sides, the angles will increase. At the two edges, the angles will increase and the other two edges, angles will decrease. So you can see, initially all angles were, in this cube, all the angles were 90 degree. Angles between adjacent edge, uh, sides. But now you can see, two of them are 90 minus a specific number, gamma and two of them are 90 plus gamma. This gamma xy is actually uh, shear strain. It will be uh, measured in radians. So shear strain gamma, it can be written in this form. And uh, using Hooke's law, like previously we have used Hooke's law, which is equal to, which is uh, written as normal stress is equal to E into normal strain. So, in terms of shear, shear stress and shear strain, Hooke's law can be written as shear stress is equal to G, which is modulus of rigidity, into shear strain xy, uh, in the xy direction. Similarly, shear strain in the yz z direction is equal to G into shear strain in the yz direction. Shear stress in the zx direction is G, shear strain in zx direction. G is modulus of rigidity and it is resistance to the shear strain, resistance to the change in angles. Here's an example problem upon the topic of shear strain and shear stress. 
a rectangular block of material with modulus of rigidity g equal to 90 kilo pound, uh, kilo pounds per square inch ksi is bonded to two rigid horizontal plates here you can see a rectangular box this one the shaded portion in between a top and a bottom plate rigid plates so that is the top and bottom plate they are rigid there will be no change in the shape or change in the length but the rectangular block has a modulus of rigidity so it means it can be deformed it has a modulus of rigidity rigid materials have infinite number of modulus of rigidity but uh, deformable materials have a positive number of modulus of rigidity okay the lower plate is fixed while the upper plate is subjected to a horizontal force so this plate the lower plate it is fixed with the ground while the upper plate is subjected to a force p knowing that the upper plate moves through 0.04 inches under the action of the force determine the average shearing strain in the material and the force exerted on the plate by applying this force p the upper plate moves towards the uh, toward, uh, moves in the direction of the force p uh, with a distance of 0.04 inches we have to find the average shearing strain in the material gamma and the force exerted p okay here i will draw, draw a two dimensional figure by looking from this view if this is my front view from this direction i have to draw two dimensional figure here here's a top plate and here's a bottom plate the bottom plate is fixed with the ground it will not move okay the top plate is attached to the rectangular block by applying the force p the bottom plate is fixed at its position but top plate will move with a distance of 0 0.04 inches okay here we can see that a new triangle has been developed one side of the triangle is 0 0.04 inch the height is 2 inches so you can find the angle the change in angle this angle gamma using trigonometry we can find angle gamma we will find it here it is like this you can see the block has deformed the bottom plate is fixed the upper plate has moved in the direction of the force with a distance of 0 0.04 inch and here you can see a triangle with one length equal to 0 0.04 inch and the other one equal to 2 inches we have to find this change in angle gamma xy so using trigonometry gamma xy is almost equal to tangent of the angle because this is a small angle strains are usually small numbers so tangent of small numbers is equal to small small angle is equal to angles in radians remember that tangent of an angle is equal to the uh, of a small angle is equal to the angle the value of the angle itself in radians so tan equal to perpendicular divided by base in this case perpendicular is 0 0.04 inch and base is 2 inches so gamma xy becomes 0 0.02 radians the first part was to find volumetric strain uh, sorry the shear strain and we have calculated it the second part was to find load p this force p so force can be calculated from stress stress into area which area which is going to slide this area of the plate or the bottom of this top plate is attached with the block this block 
this area is attached with the block and we are applying force on the uh, top plate the top plate is trying to move in the direction of the force but since it is bonded to the rectangular block so due to that bond it is uh, trying to slide there is a restriction and due to that restriction there will be shear strain in the common area between the top plate and the rectangular block this area is equal to the top the top area of the plate so the top area is actually known to us so we have to find stress first stress is equal to shear stress is equal to g into shear strain g is given to us in the problem statement which is 19 to 10 power 3 psi and 90 ksi shear strain has already been calculated which is 0 0.02 radians so the product becomes shear stress which is 1800 pounds per square inch shear stress is known to us so shear stress into area is load or force shear stress is 1800 psi already calculated area is 8 into 2.5 inches it is given to us in the problem statement here it is 8 is the length and 2.5 is the width of the top of the plate which is also a common area between the top plate and the rectangular box rectangular block so multiplying the uh, stress with the area it becomes 36 into 10 power 3 pounds a 36 kilo pounds okay the next topic is a relation among E, nu and G E is modulus of elasticity nu is Poisson's ratio and G is modulus of rigidity these are three different material properties and they must have a relationship with each other for some for the same material because if we apply axial load on any material or any bar for example uh, in the axial direction there is normal strain in one of the direction in direction of the force so this material resist it has a stiffness or models of uh, elasticity in their direction specifically but there is a strain in the other direction you can see here, if the initial length of a, of a marked uh, square is 1 cross 1, initial length of each side, after applying the force in one of the direction, it has increased by epsilon x, in the other direction, it has decreased by nu times epsilon x. So, this nu has a relationship with normal uh, properties of the material. E is a normal property against normal stress. So, modulus of elasticity has a relationship with nu. Similarly, if we apply normal stress or normal force on a material and we mark here a square a dot, uh, with the dotted lines shown here, it, is on a, uh, uh, it, it has an angle with the force P or with the direction of the force. So, after applying the force, you can see that the initial cubic element has uh, been deformed into a rhomboid our initial square has been deformed into a parallelogram so due to the applied normal force the angles have been changed so it depends upon the plane where which you you are going to study what is the direction of the plane or the angle of the plane with the applied force if it is normal so there will be only, only normal deformation if it is not a normal direction it, if, if the angle is not 90 degree so there will be a shear strain as well so these normal loads may produce shear strains and similarly due to the normal load even the lateral strain may be produced due to the axial load lateral strain may be produced so these properties the sharing properties the normal properties and the Poisson ratio they have some relationship with each other which has been defined here E over 2G is equal to 1 plus nu modulus of elasticity divided by 2 times modulus of rigidity is equal to 1 plus Poisson's ratio the derivation of this expression is not necessary 
if you want its derivation it is available in the books so you can go and read it but I will use this expression in our numerical problems if one of the th three parameters sorry if two of the three parameters e g and nu are given so we can find the third one if for, for a single material if for any material nu is given to us and g is given to us and we need to if, if we need e for some specific calculation we can use this expression to find e similarly if any other two of these properties are given we can find the third one okay here's a sample problem sample problem 2.5 from the textbook a circle of diameter 9 inch is 9 inches is, is inscribed on an unstressed aluminum plate of thickness equal to 3 by 4 inches force acting in the plane of the plate later causes normal stress of sigma x equal to 12 ksi and sigma z equal to 20 ksi ok here is a thin plate which is a thickness in the third dimension in the vertical direction which is equal to 3 by 4 inches it is uh, before applying any stress sigma x and sigma z a dotted circle has been scribed here you can see it ABCD circle it is circle so its diameter AB and diameter CD both are equal the diameter of the circle is given to us which is 9 inches so AB length and CD length both are 9 each before the application of the sigma x and sigma z later after scribing the circle the two forces or the two stresses have been applied and definitely it will expand in the x and z direction this plate will expand in the x and z direction due to the applied forces but it will contract in the y direction similarly due to the force in x direction due to the expansion in the x direction there will be some contraction in the z direction but then due to the applied force in z direction there will be some contraction in the x direction as well and due to both the tension forces in x and z direction there will be compression in the y direction so there is strain in all the three directions then either tensile or compressive so what have been asked from us to find or to determine the change in the length of diameter AB so initial diameter AB is 9 inches after application of the sigma Z and sigma X what is the change in AB either positive or negative so it is actually a normal strain initial length of AB is 9 inches we have to just find strain in AB what is strain in AB actually AB is in the X direction so we have to find first we have to find epsilon x okay from this we can find change in AB if we know the epsilon x we can and we know the initial length of uh, AB so we can find change in AB similarly the second part is change in the length, length of diameter CD so initial uh, diameter CD is known to us CD is in the Z direction so we need to know epsilon z from this epsilon z we can find change in diameter cd because change in length per unit length is equal to strain then thickness of the plate thickness is in y direction <coughs> so for this for change in thickness we have to find strain in y direction and initial thickness is given to us which is 3 by 4 inches and finally change in the volume of the plate change in the volume of the plate so volume of the plate change in volume of the plate is equal to sum of the three strains epsilon x epsilon y and epsilon z we have derived this in our topic of dilatation so we will move first using generalized hooke's law we know the expression of generalized hooke's law we can find the three strains epsilon x epsilon y and epsilon z using generalized Hooke's law sigma x sigma y and sigma z are given to us sigma x sigma y and sigma z are given to us sigma x is 12 ksi sigma 
z is 20 ksi and there is no stress or force in the y direction so sigma y is 0 12 ksi 0 and 20 ksi e is given to us and nu is given to us in the statement e is 10 into 10 power 6 psi and nu is 1 by 3 so we know all the terms on the right side of this expression so we can find epsilon x which is 0 0.533 into 10 power minus 3 <coughs> inch by inch means it has no unit strain has no units similarly epsilon y using generalized Hooke's law we know all the terms on the right side of the expression so we can find strain in y direction and similarly stress in uh, strain in z direction so you can see strain in x and z direction are positive but strain in y direction is negative because due to the tensile forces in x and z directions there will be compression in the y direction that is why it is in uh, it has a negative sign <coughs> So we have found three strains in three directions, x, y, and z directions. So as discussed earlier, diameter in AB, diameter AB was in x direction. So del AB, delta or change in length per unit length is equal to strain. So delta is equal to strain into length. So change in length AB is equal to strain in x direction because AB is in x direction to length of AB which is diameter so we know strain in x direction and we know the given diameter so we can find change in diameter AB similarly change in diameter CD is equal to strain in z direction because CD is in z direction and the initial length of diameter CD which is D strain is known to us diameter is known to us so we can find change in CD similarly change in the thickness <coughs> is equal to thickness is in the y direction so strain in the y direction and initial thickness every change in the length is equal to strain in that direction multiplied by initial length in that direction so strain in y direction and initial length and initial thickness both are known to us so change in thickness is negative because there was compression in the negative in the y direction and then the net change in volume is discussed earlier dilatation is equal to sum of the three volume sum of the three strains so by adding epsilon x epsilon y and epsilon z which we have calculated here earlier we can find dilatation which is 1.067 into 10 power minus 3 dilatation is change in volume per unit original volume so change in volume will be dilatation into initial volume so dil dilatation is already calculated here 1.067 and initial volume can be calculated by multiplying the side the length of the sides initially so length of the initial sides are 15 inch 15 inch and thickness thickness is 3 by 4 inches so 15 into 15 into 3 by 4 or 0 0.75 which is initial volume dilatation is 1.067 so the change in volume is equal to 0 0.187 so the net change in volume is positive it is increase in volume actually okay <clears throat> the next topic is composite materials what are composite materials actually composites are combination of more than one type of materials which are physically and chemically distinct they are not homogeneously mixed they are isotropic materials there will be directionally dependent properties the composite materials usually have different properties in different directions in the x y and z directions the materials for example one of them is re reinforcement the other is matrix so the reinforcements are mixed into matrix to increase its properties one of the best example is concrete reinforcement beams in the con concrete reinforcement beams the concrete is a matrix and the steel bars are reinforcement are fibers the steel bars are mixed with the concrete to increase its tensile strength because the concrete, concrete itself has a very poor tensile strength.
tensile properties. So composite materials are tailored materials. They are man-made materials which are tailored or which are designed to, to increase some targeted properties in targeted directions. So a composite material which has a reinforcement and a matrix has directional dependent properties it depends upon the direction of the reinforcement in a concrete reinforcement beam you can see that the tensile strength in the direction of the steel bars is higher as compared to the other directions similarly <clears throat> one of the famous type of uh, composite material is fiber reinforced composite material where fibers of different materials are reinforced into matrix matrices the fibers can be steel it can made of steel it can be made of carbon or glass or a natural fiber which are reinforced into either polymer or, ma uh, or metals or ceramics so fiber reinforced composite materials are formed from lamina of fibers of graphite glass are polymer embedded into different resins or matrices either of polymer metal or ceramics they have different directions depending upon they have different properties in different directions depending upon the direction of the fibers or the reinforcement so for example here you can see some fibers you can see the uh, the fibers in the cross section so this material will bear more load in the direction of the fibers here are direction of the fibers inside this matrix which are not visible here so they are made with different layers of the fibers if the same fibers are placed with the same density in the other direction so it will have same properties in the other direction as well so such kind of materials have different moduli of elasticity in different directions in the x y and z directions Similarly, different Poisson's ratio in different planes, XY plane and XZ plane. Similarly, YZ plane. So, <clears throat> materials with directionally dependent mechanical properties are called anisotropic. So, composite materials are just a type of or an example of anisotropic materials. Up till now, we have discussed all the isotropic materials. So, in the future, in some other subject, you may discuss or you may study about an isotropic materials as well. Here, we have just defined the composite materials. We are not discussing them in detail, but you just need to know that there may be some materials which may have different properties in different directions, different, num different number of E, different models of elasticity in different directions, similarly different Poisson's ratio in different directions. Up till now, we have studied a single uh, um, models of elasticity for a single material, similarly single Poisson ratio for a single material because we have discussed isotropic materials only. If we discuss about or if we study about anisotropic material, there will be different properties in different directions. Okay. The next topic, which is a very important one, is sand penance principle. It is about stress concentrations. So whenever we apply concentrated forces generally in reality there is no concentrated force all forces are distributed over some area concentrated force is just considered to be applied at a specific point and a point has a area equal to zero so we know that stress is equal to force divided by area if we consider a force as a concentrated force it is assumed to be applied at a point and point has a zero area so it means the stress must be infinite but there can uh, the no the, but but no material can bear infinite stresses so it means if we are applying concentrated force on any material it is theoretically correct but practically it is not a concentrated force otherwise it will produce infinite stress in that locality and material will material will fail so concentrated forces do not exist but there may be forces which are applied on very narrow regions so here are shown some forces for example if a concentrated force is applied here it will produce maximum damage in the vicinity of the point of application of the force but instead of that 
if we place a rigid plate a two rigid plates at the two ends and then we apply concentrated force on the rigid plate the rigid plates do not or the rigid materials do not undergo any deformation so it will push or compress the whole surface uniformly this is an ideal condition but if there is an a uh, there is a concentrated force the concentrated force will produce um, stress concentrations Similarly, if there are sharp points, there will be stress concentrations. So loads transmitted through rigid plates result in uniform distribution of stress and strain. But if there are concentrated loads, they result in large stresses in the vicinity of the load application point. And stress and strain distribution become uniform at a relatively short distance from the load application point. For example, if we applied concentrated force at a point, so there will be maximum stress in the vicinity of the load application point. As soon as we move away from the load application point from here or here or here, we go down or we go away from the load application point. So the stress value will uh, tend to be constant with, going, uh, with, with increase in distance from the load uh, application point. But in, in case of a rigid plate here, the stresses in the cross section of this member will be same throughout. So the actual point to be noted here is stress and strain distribution become uniform at a relatively short distance from the load application point. So if we are applying force P as soon as we go away from P if we are very near to the P, for example, length of this, sorry, width of this plate is B. And we move away from the point of application of force P by a distance of B by 4. So the difference between maximum and minimum stress will be huge. Stress in the line of action of the force will be maximum and the stress away from the line of force will be and reduced so the distance the difference between this maximum and minimum force is given here the minimum uh, minimum stress sorry the minimum stress is equal to 0 0.198 times the average stress and maximum stress is equal to 2.575 times the average stress what is average stress it is p over a which we usually calculate but there is a di huge difference between this minimum and maximum stress but if we go down or go away by a distance of b by 2 b is actually width of this plate by a distance of b by 2 from the point of application or the plane of application of the force so we can see that the difference between maximum and minimum stress has reduced and the max the minimum force stress is equal to 0 0.6 times the average stress and maximum stress is equal to 0. sorry 1.3 times the average stress so the dif difference between minimum and maximum has reduced as compared to the previous case. Again, if we move further away at a distance of B, which is equal to the width of the plate, a distance B from th the surface of application of the force. So we can see there is a minimum difference between maximum and minimum stress. Minimum stress is 0 0.9 times sigma average and maximum stress is 1.027 times sigma average. So this is almost same. The maximum and minimum stresses are almost same. 0 0.9 and 1 are almost equal. So maximum and minimum stresses are almost same. If we are going away from the point of application of the force. But if as soon as we move towards the point of application of the force, there will be stress concentration there will be localized maximum stresses which is a very important topic maximum stress at any point or in the vicinity of the load application point may produce the maximum damage which we have not discussed until now so we will discuss it in the St. Penance principle or in this specific topic stress distribution may be assumed independent of the mode of load application except in the immediate vicinity of the load application point so Stress distribution or the intensity of stress 
is very serious or very important only in the immediate vicinity of the load application points. Okay. Here are some specific cases. One of the cases is a hole in a plate. We can see there's a hole in the okay. Before that, we need to know a relationship between maximum stress and average. Previously, we have seen that there are maximum stresses and minimum stresses. There's a distribution of stress on surfaces. So somewhere it will be maximum in the load vicinity, load uh, application point near the load application point, and it will be minimum away from the load application point. There is a variation between maximum and minimum. So this maximum stress is very important for us, not the minimum one. In each case, maximum stress is important for us. So there is a relationship between average and maximum stress. The ratio of maximum stress to the average stress is called stress concentration factor, K. If the maximum stress is much higher, so there will be a higher stress concentration factor, K. Okay. In some cases where the plates or the bodies have irregularities like holes or fillets or sharp points, so there will be stress concentrations. There will be maximum stress near the sharp points or the irregularities. So just like that, if a plate has a hole, hole is an irregularity or a flaw, so we can see that around the hole stress will be maximum and near the hole, like here, it will be at this point, at the edge of the hole, stress will be maximum. We have just sectioned this plate and we have seen that stress is maximum at the uh, edge of the hole. Okay, and as, as soon as we go away from the edge of the hole, it starts reducing and it will be, it starts reducing, it will be minimum at the outer edge. Okay. Normal stress or average stress is equal to force divided by area. Force is the externally applied force. And what is area? Area is the cross-sectional area. In this case, this cross-sectional area, which is equal to the total, in this case, it is equal to width D into thickness in the third dimension, D into T. But if there is a hole, so we have to reduce the diameter of the hole, which is two times radius. We have to reduce the diameter of the hole from the thickness because the whole thickness is not under the stress. It is only this shaded portion which is under the stress. So what we have to do, it will be, area will be D minus the diameter of the hole. This capital D is not diameter, capital D is the width of the plate minus diameter is 2R into thickness. This shaded portion is the area under force or under stress. So this area is inserted in this expression P divided by area. So we can find every stress with this expression. Average can be calculated like this. If we know K, so we can find maximum stress. So how can we find K? K can be found from this chart for a plate with a hole in its center. So for a plate with a hole, capital D is in this case is the width of the plate, R is radius of the hole, small d, here in this case, small d is or half of the, sorry, small d is capital D, width of the plate, minus diameter of the hole. Okay. So this chart is given to us. From this chart, we can find K. K is a geometric property. Stress concentration factor is a geometric property. It will be different for different geometries. If the value of D, which is width of the plate, or R, which is radius of the diameter of the, uh, radius of the hole, if D and R changes, K will change. In this curve, or in this chart, R over D is the horizontal axis. R is radius of the 
whole and small d is given in this expression and on the vertical axis it is stress concentration factor k so for different ratios of r over d we have different values of k for example if r over d is 0 0.45 so k is here which is equal to 2.2 .2. this k has no unit because it is a ratio between similar quantities okay so we can find k for this geometry for a plate with a hole in the center similarly if we have another kind of configuration a fillet of radius r and external force p is applied it has two thicknesses this plate a larger thickness capital d and a smaller thickness small d remember that you have to see in different books <coughs> different symbols are used for thickness and width so in this specific book capital d and small d have been used even in this book the charts are different in different editions in this specific edition this uh, graph is from the third edition you can see the horizontal axis is r over d in the other edition it may be 2 r over d so you have to use it according to the edition the net answer will be same but some charts are some charts involve different uh, ratios and different values okay in this case horizontal axis is r over d where r is radius of the pellet and small d is the smaller width uh, or the width of the smaller part of the plate okay there are different curves all for different d over d ratios capital d over small d ratios so for example if we have a configuration where our r over d ratio is for example uh, 0.18 and our capital d over small d ratio is for example 2 we have to use this curve outermost 2 so for 0 0.18 we extend this line and where it intersect the curve you can see the value of k which is 2 in this case it will be different in different cases if the given if our d over d ratio is not present in this chart we have to use interpolation method we have to find the value of k for different curves and then we can use interpolation something in between them here we can see again stress is maximum near the edges of the fillet and it will be it will decrease as soon as we go away from the sharp points again in this case maximum stress over every stress is equal to k so if we can find k from this chart k is a geometric property and we find sigma average is p over a we will have to use minimum area so that stress is maximum there are two areas here one is this one and the other one is on this side we have to use the minimum one to get the maximum stress okay here's an example problem example 2.12 where a plate with two fillets is given determine the largest axial load p that can be safely supported by a flat steel bar which is given in the figure consisting of two portions both 10 mm thick for this bar which is two portions one with the larger width capital d and the other with smaller width small d it has a thickness of 10 mm for both the portions radius r is 8 mm okay 40 and 60 mm wide the small d is 40 mm and capital d is 60 mm assume an allowable normal stress of sigma allowable or sigma maximum allowable is maximum it is 165 megapascal it is given to us in this case what we have to find largest axial load p p how can we find p p can be calculated from the average stress okay 
Okay, from the average stress we can find P. But how will we find average stress? Average stress will be calculated from this expression. Maximum divided by average is equal to K. So sigma maximum is given to us. K can be found from the tables, uh, from the, sorry, from the chart, given charts. So K will be known from the chart. Maximum stress is given to us. We can find sigma average and from sigma average we can find P. Okay. So the next task is to find K. For K, we need small r over small d ratio and capital D over small d ratios. Small r is 40 mm. Sorry, uh, small r is 8 mm. Small d is 40 mm and capital D is 60 mm. Here we will find ratios. Capital D over small d is 1.5 and r over d is 0 0.2. So we're going to the chart 0 0.2 and 1.5. Here is 0 0.2 and we have to use the chart of 1.5, this one, this chart. This line is here. By extending this one, here if you have roller on a paper you can see this is almost 8.2. The approximation should be approximation should be near to the value given on the chart. It is almost 1.82. Some people may think like it is 1.83 or 1.81. That is also correct. So k is equal to 1.82. You cannot just assume it as uh, 2 or less than 1.8. It is something between 1.8 and 2, and it is near like 1.82. K is 1.82. Sigma maximum is given to us. So by using this expression, we can find sigma average, which is 90.7 megapascal. Now, P is equal to, P over area is equal to sigma average. As discussed earlier, I have told you that we have to use the smaller area. This one. So this part of the plate has a width of 40 mm and thickness is given to us which is 10 mm. It's given the problem. So area is 40 into 10. We will not use this thickness. We will use the smaller area because with the smaller area stresses are maximum. Which is important. Maximum stress is always important. So area is 40 into 10. Sigma average has been calculated as 90.7 from the previous expression. By putting the values, P is equal to 36.3 into 10 power 3 newtons. Remember that 90.7 into 10 power 6 pascal has to be used. Sorry, if it is in megapascal and length is in millimeter, you can directly use them. Either convert the length and megapascal length into millimeters, meters and stress into pascals are used stress in megapascal and length in millimeters so p becomes 36.3 kilonewtons it was very easy just you have to find the correct value of k and use the expression of k sigma maximum and sigma average okay we will move there are many other problems on this topic in the exercise of the book i recommend you to use to to solve some of the problems even there, is, there are some problems, example problems and exercise problems where there will be a configuration having both hole and the fillets. So I have solved one of such kind, kind of problem in the exercise in a separate lecture. You can see that lecture. Okay. The, other top, the next topic is elastoplastic materials. The, up till now we have discussed about elastic behavior of a material and then in the stress strain, strain diagram you have also discussed about plasticity or the permanent deformation. Okay, <clears throat> up till now in our example problems and the recent topics we have discussed about linear stress strain relationship or the elastic behavior. The elasticity or the elastic behavior is good enough 
for brittle materials. Brittle materials do not undergo the permanent deformation and they do not undergo yielding. If the yield stress of a ductile material is exceeded, the plastic deformation occurs. In the brittle materials, there is no yield limit on yield stress. In the, brittle, in the ductile materials, if we cross the yield limit, the material will be permanently deformed. Just like here, here is a yield limit at point B and if the stress increases, we will enter into a plastic region, this one. Material will be permanently deformed. Analysis of plastic deformation is simplified by assuming an idealized elastoplastic material. Deformations of an elastoplastic material are divided into elastic and plastic range and permanent deformations result from loading beyond the yield stress. Here is an assumption. This is a perfectly elastoplastic material. This is an assumption that material will undergo an elastic deformation until yield strength and if we remove the load it will return to its original position. After yielding it will be permanently deformed. There will be no, uh, turn, uh, there will be no uh, point of return. It may return but it will not return to zero strain. There will be some permanent strain which is indicated here. The in a perfectly elastoplastic material we do not go beyond yield strength. So we have flattened the curve at yield strength. But actually they go above the yield. There is an ultimate strength or ultimate limit. If we unload a material within the elastic limit it will return to zero. But from a plastic region like at point C which is in plastic region if we unload a material it will return to a non-zero strain at point D. And if we further apply a reverse load, a compression on it, it will go undergo negative uh, compression, a uh, negative stress, there will be a negative stress. Upon further uh, loading, there will be negative strain. Again, if we apply a positive load or positive stress, there will be tension. Similarly, if we unstress a material, or apply a reverse load from any point in the elastic in the plastic region it will return there will be a non zero strain upon compression there will be negative stress and negative strains and from any negative stress and negative strain region again applying tensile load it will again follow the same curve it will touch it here so this is elastoplastic behavior of a material by unloading a material from the plastic region, it will return to some positive strain point. There will be no, uh, it cannot return to initial position. And if we apply reverse load, a compressive load, there will be negative strain and negative stresses. Upon applying tensile load again, it will follow the same value of E it will touch the curve, the initial curve somewhere in the plastic region. The next topic and the last one is residual stresses. Residual stress is a permanent stress. When we apply reverse loading on a material or if we apply or if we relax a material from the plastic region, it will recover but it will not return to its initial position. There will be some permanent strain in the material. Just like at point D or point D dash, we have shown that materials have returned, but there is some permanent strain in the material, permanent deformation in the material. Due to this permanent deformation, although we have removed the applied load, at point D and point D dash, we can see that the value of stress is zero because it lies on the horizontal axis, stress is on the vertical axis. So there is no stress because load is zero, there is no applied stress. But, some there, but since there is some permanent deformation, so there must be some permanent stress in the material, which remains forever. And this stress is called residual stress. So when a single structure element is loaded uniformly beyond its yield stress, and then unloaded, it is permanently deformed, but all stresses disappear. This is not the general result. In the stress strain diagram, we can see that if a material 
is unloaded from its plastic region it will return to a zero stress state there is permanent strain but no stress because stress is on the vertical axis it seems like this but actually it is not like this there will be some permanent stress induced in this material which is called residual stress the residual stresses will remain in the structure after loading and unloading if the structure undergoes plastic deformation are different parts of the structure undergoes different plastic deformations and the residual stresses also result from uneven heating and cooling it, it can also be uh, induced in the material that they may also occur due to thermal changes uneven heating and uneven cooling and the residual stresses remain forever okay this is all about chapter number 2 after this there are some numerical problems which i uh, i have discussed in a separate lecture if you have, you have any question or any query regarding the theory part of the chapter or regarding the numerical parts of the chapter or exercise problem you may contact me on my email address and i will try to answer your queries thank you